to one of the first sessions of the first day uh, here at SPI. I hope people weren't out on the crafts tables too late last night. Uh, a few reminders, please. Silence phones um, and Blackberries and otherwise. We will have time for Q&A uh, at the end of the session. The slides that Stacy's going to go through will be available, I believe, on the mobile app uh, later today. And please fill out the session evaluation form uh, at the end. So I'm Jamie Evans, and I work at Panasonic, and I promise I'm not here to sell TVs and VCRs. Most people uh, still associate the brand with consumer electronics, which is justifiable. We've been doing it for a long time, and it continues to be a big part of our global business. What most people don't realize is that 25% of our global P&L is our energy business. And that spans solar modules, inverters, building management systems, energy management systems, HVAC, lighting controls, uh, a whole range of products and solutions um, that, that underlie the core energy business globally. So I run our US eco business, which is primarily focused on solar solutions. So unlike most parts of Panasonic, I have no product mandate. I don't have to use Panasonic components in our systems. We're more focused on engineering, project integration, financing, long-term service on the back end. We do that mostly in the commercial and small utility markets, so working with corporations, municipalities, school districts, uh, and utilities on you know, medium and large scale solar assets. So while that is the core of uh, the business today, we do look for unique, sort of forward thinking, uh, interesting projects to be a part of. Um, and you know, Power Tree that we'll talk about today is exactly that kind of project. And we, along with uh, the other panelists here, um, ultimately got excited and very supportive around uh, what we think is a very unique application that combines solar with electric vehicles, with grid um, interface, and is um, a project that not unlike regular solar projects, had a number of obstacles and challenges that had to be overcome. Um, so along with uh, Panasonic support, um, we've been working with uh, Stacy Rhinaxis, the, uh, the entrepreneur who sort of had the vision uh, for this project, Adam Langton from the California Public Utilities Commission, Heather Sanders from Cal ISO, and Janice Lynn from the California Energy Storage Alliance. So a varied group um, of people who ultimately worked with Stacy to start to implement this project. So we've all obviously heard the pitch uh, and heard the story and been involved sort of living this project uh, for a long time now, but I thought it would be helpful for the group uh, to sort of hear the pitch uh, and for us to hear the pitch again from Stacy. Uh, so he'll tell us what this is all about. Thank you very much. I'm gonna stand up and walk around a little bit because it's easier for me to talk that way. Uh, my name is Stacy Renexis. I'm CEO and founder of uh, PowerTree Services. Uh, we're based in San Francisco. And what I'm going to dive into here is a little bit about PowerTree's uh, general model and also uh, some specifics about our first uh, public rollout, which is what we call the San Francisco One project. Uh, PowerTree uh, has developed uh, custom uh, battery, uh, vehicle control, and uh, software systems uh, to provide an integrated set of energy services focused on multi-unit and multi-tenant properties. 
Um, as many of you no doubt know, that's a particularly difficult segment uh, to, uh, to move into. Uh, as 93% of existing residential solar uh, and existing uh, electric vehicles have all gone to people who have single family homes. Yet about 42% of the California population uh, resides in a rented property. So our business is not one of selling products, it's one of providing services in concert with the property owner. And those services cover solar power generation, electric vehicle uh, charging services, and uh, a variety of grid services. So the project itself, uh, although we, had, we did an announcement about the first 68 sites, has actually been expanded uh, and is actually now 101 buildings, uh, all being equipped concurrently in the city uh, of San Francisco. Every one of these is an apartment building. Uh, the total power and energy capacity is about 102 electric vehicle charging ports, each of which is capable of 20 kilowatts of charging. So yes, your Tesla dual charger can charge, uh, as well as your Nissan Leaf or your Chevy Volt, uh, as fast as your vehicle can take it. Uh, it has about uh, 400 kilowatts of solar across all of the buildings, uh, and five megawatt hours of energy storage uh, across all 100 buildings with a total of a 12 megawatt power range that is then aggregated via secure IP communication and will be provided to the California ISO for use as a ancillary service for regulation. Uh, some other interesting statistics about this, um, and I'll get out of your line of sight there, um, is that in these 100 buildings, we're serving about 5,500 tenants, and within a one block radius, 55,000 apartments, or about 12% of the total San Francisco population, able to now access reliable electric vehicle charging in one project. This is a great example of scale and uh, focus by going after a market that others have had a hard time penetrating. So the key concept uh, behind this is, as you know, with solar, you're usually stuck with one revenue stream. Maybe if you're lucky, you've got a backup. Here, we've got multiple revenue streams and a couple that fall out because of the combination. So we link these together in a mutually reinforcing way. First thing is we provide solar utilizing virtual net metering to uh, tenants and the the energy is not sold to the tenant. We actually rent the panels to the tenant so that the tenant puts out no money, the building owner puts out no money, but the energy that's produced is applied on the tenant's energy bill by the utility. The electric vehicle charging is done in a similar fashion. We call it, uh, the shorthand would be Netflix for fuel. All the fuel and all the parking you need uh, while you're fueling for one flat price per month. So, and that is priced at about one-third of the equivalent cost of gasoline, creating a very strong economic incentive as the average person spends about $400 a month on gasoline in California. Then grid services, where we aggregate all of these together and provide them as a regulation resource for the California ISO, and we wind up with multiple revenue streams that we're able to count on, including fallbacks. For example, in the case of solar, we not only can rent to the, uh, to the tenant, but we can then sell any unrented uh, capacity to the, to the building owner or use it to offset our own consumption. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that's happening, I'm sure everybody has seen this. Has anybody not seen this chart? One person, Tether, you're doing a great job. Uh, so, when you look at more and more solar going onto the grid and other types of renewables, uh, we face uh, the, the inevitable uh, volatility problem. I'm sure everybody has thought about this, heard about it ad nauseum. Uh, with uh, solar or wind, you have volatility. When you have volatility, the CAISO, a couple years back, did a very interesting study on the, 30, the impact of reaching 33% RPS in California. What they found was that GHG emissions and fuel use in the conventional uh, generation plants was going to increase 
not decrease as we got more and more volatile renewables onto the grid. And this is where energy storage and electric vehicles come in. Because with uh, energy storage, you can smooth this out and actually achieve the desired GHG reductions. And by integrating energy storage with electric vehicles, we help the grid obtain that same capability at the point of load in one of the major load centers in California. One of the other uh, big motivators behind this is that uh, EV sales are now mandated in California under the uh, AB32 clean air uh, law that was passed some years ago. Uh, the plan is pretty ambitious and the law is pretty ambitious with, a, with right now 3% of all vehicles, new vehicles being sold, uh, being required to be zero emissions. In some markets it's actually over 10% already. So there's actually greater demand than the regulation is calling for. And the plan calls for 90% of the on-road vehicles, think about that, 90% of the on-road vehicles by 2050 to be zero emissions. So this is an enormous transition. Uh, when you then take a, combine that kind of goal with what's been going on in the housing market, uh, you can see in the light green line here that renters have been increasing as a percentage of the overall national population, and this is even more so uh, in uh, California. Now, so we have first an enormous move towards electric vehicles, second we have more and more renters, uh, and then third we have an active legislature and government in California that is behind these policies. So some of the drivers uh, on the policy level, EVs are selling very popular, as much as 10% of, of new vehicle sales in San Francisco and LA and San Diego. Uh, we have uh, several laws, AB 1092, recent decisions, thank you, Adam, uh, from the PUC about helping to uh, cover many of the costs of infrastructure development. Um, the AB 2514 storage mandate, thank you, Janice, and very much on that one, um, to help move the utilities to accepting storage, accepting EVs, and, and getting the market barriers out of the way. So one of the big issues in a lot of this was a lot of advanced groundwork in helping to get the policies right. And that's why we have such a policy strong uh, panel here too. Uh, and then new rates uh, are coming down, which will be a very interesting uh, discussion uh, in and of itself. So. Now you say, okay, we've got 40% of the overall population, but that's pretty spread out. Why can't people do that? Well, most people live in cities. And when you live in a city, you don't have a regular parking location. You may have a parking location, but it's not the same one day to day. It's street cleaning, towing, right? Maybe it's a shared lot because the building owner doesn't want to let you uh, become a tenant of that particular spot and own it for the rest of eternity, right? There's a lot of these kinds of issues that, that pop up. And that means that the majority of the urban population who own, still own vehicles uh, have no reliable means of getting charged on a daily basis. So they either have to go to workplace or they have to find some other publicly accessible source. And we enable that in a grid-friendly, economically viable, and a convenient fashion. Uh, to emphasize this, so you can see here in the city of San Francisco, 67% of the population rents. All right, this, is an, this is one of the reasons why we started there. Pick your, pick your starting market and then make the, make the problems uh, as small as possible. They'll still be there, but make them small. And in California, oh, as a whole, this means 16 million people in California fit this kind of profile. It's a very significant market. It's interesting. It's not taking some of the heights. So now thinking about solar and the value of solar, if you apply solar to do different things, that energy, that kilowatt hour, is going to have a different value depending on how you use it. You know, we are used to thinking of it in terms of peak time versus off-peak time, or part peak, or you know, power maybe. But if you think about it versus gasoline, it becomes very interesting. Taking an average of about 14 cents a kilowatt hour and four miles uh, per kilowatt hour in an, in an EV uh, capability, that means you have a cost per mile of about three and a half cents. Uh, if you 
compare that to the average fleet, according to the DOE, of 20 miles per gallon on the existing on-road cars and an average of $4 a gallon, that means you're 20 cents a mile to drive on gasoline, not counting oil changes and repairs and the rest. If you run that math back, that means that it's about 80 cents a kilowatt hour to drive on gasoline. Now, that's a pretty darn good price for a kilowatt hour. And it's almost six times as much than running lights or other, other services, and I won't even talk about the wholesale multiple. Now, the other thing that's happening is people are liking these cars, as I said, 10%, but they're also wanting the cars to charge faster and faster. So this is a two-year trend of the average rate of charge of all of the vehicles uh, that have been sold in the United States. As you can see, the rate of charge is increasing dramatically. So this means as we get millions of cars on the road running at 10 or 20 kilowatts apiece while charging, that becomes a really big number. So there's going to be a very interesting generation requirement, energy requirement behind that, and uh, management requirement for all of those vehicles. One of the very interesting things with electric vehicles, now this is for California, is that the top chart shows the hour by hour level of charging from the existing 100,000 vehicles in California. And the bottom chart shows the projected uh, overall grid load uh, in California after renewable generation. They look like a terrific complement. So this is one of the nice grid benefits and the wins for all of us in that the, the more the electric vehicles are on the road, the smoother the overall uh, net load curve becomes, making it easier for more renewables to get put into the grid. So electric vehicles, storage, and renewables are natural allies. Just a quick reminder of the project. And then here is what one of our stations looks like. So in this, uh, in this station, this goes inside a building. We have solar uh, on its own meter. We have high current electric vehicle charging. We have a custom designed chassis that's connected uh, and holds 48 kilowatts of power, uh, battery-based inverter power, and 51 kilowatt hours of lithium-based uh, energy storage, coupled with a KISO meter and other controls and software. Uh, it's a custom-designed chassis. We can actually install two of these chassis with a single four-man crew in one day. All right. So standardization is another big, big challenge in this. And in simplifying it, you've got to standardize your model. And we've worked also with the utility to standardize our SLDs so that we go in with one of a, of a very limited set of designs. And the utility is already familiar with it, so we don't have to spend another year and a half educating them in all of the different divisions. I know some of the people in here have probably had that joy. Um, and then on the vehicle side, we actually identify your vehicle, not you, as the, uh, as the item that is subscribed to the service. Here's uh, an example of what one of these looks like uh, actually in place. As you can see, it's very thin. We actually fit all of that in eight square feet of floor space. Uh, it does weigh a little bit. Lithium, uh, lithium cells are not so light. And then on the finance side, we had a multi-step financing strategy that had to come in play with this. It's not just a go out, you know, sell a product to somebody and walk away. We had to plan for the operation of this. So the first step, seed development, bring the capital together, acquire the properties, uh, sign long-term agreements, uh, get the necessary uh, incentives that are out there. There's the self-generation incentive program in, in California, as well as uh, other local incentives and tax credits. But we needed to achieve a necessary critical mass so that we could participate in the markets, that we could uh, also have enough stations to be attractive to EV drivers and convenient as you're, as you're going around town, and to be cost effective so that we can actually deploy teams at scale and achieve economies of scale. Uh, then we needed to have the actual EPC capital and vendor support to actually build. Thank you, Jamie. Um, and then we actually had to do the work and get the stuff built. And that's where we're in the middle of right now. 
Um, and the, the utilities have been going through quite a learning curve on this, but they have really started uh, to, uh, to get behind it and uh, start learning how energy storage is different than solar, is different than the load. And that's been no mean feat, and it's an ongoing challenge for, for anywhere we go. And then finally, you do a takeout or a long-term finance uh, once you have an operational history, and then, of course, repeat, repeat, repeat. Now, one other very interesting piece that I'll share is what to expect in terms of the cost breakouts when you think about this. About 55, 56% is your actual equipment and meters and legal costs and other things. In our case, across all of these projects, 45% of our top line cost is utility interconnection. That's the big, the big bear. Don't underestimate that uh, when you're going in because the utility interconnection costs more than the actual equipment. And I'll leave it there. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Stacy. Uh, so a clearly a very innovative project, very different from a standard uh, solar project that most people here are probably familiar with. So having heard sort of the, the story and the pitch, um, you know, Panasonic was excited to be involved, um, you know, because it was a project at a municipal scale, because it started to combine different technologies. Um, you know, one of the first questions we asked internally was how big can this be? You know, how, how can we scale this and grow this model? Uh, <clears throat> So we got on board uh, pretty quickly, but I'm curious. Um, and over the next, you know, half an hour, uh, want to have a discussion with the panelists. But at the outset, sort of, when when you heard the pitch, you know, what was the initial point of excitement or the reason that your organizations, you know, ultimately got on board and got it excited about this? Maybe start with Adam. Sure. Uh, let's, yeah, I'm on. Um, so uh, when Stacy first came to CPUC to describe the project, um, I think we're interested for a number of reasons. I mean, this project, as you can see, includes solar, batteries, uh, battery storage, and electric vehicle charging. Um, and those are three things that we're trying to push here in California and get greater adoption of. Um, his project also has the potential to interconnect to the wholesale market and provide grid services, another area that we're trying to build on. Um, so he, he's got all the things that we're trying to work on, and it's kind of, it's in one project. So when Stacy first came to uh, pitch this to us and uh, describe kind of the interconnection issues that he was, was having, uh, one of the things that I said to the other folks working on this is that if we can solve these problems that it, that he's facing on this project, there's so it opens up so many opportunities for other projects that are that are smaller that have that have fewer uh, barriers because there's so many elements here um, that are so important to what we're doing. So that was one element to it. Uh, the other element is the importance of getting charging infrastructure into apartment buildings uh, because we think that's a major barrier to electric vehicle adoption. And as we see for a lot of energy issues in apartments, you have this split incentive where you have an owner of the property uh, who could build, uh, could install energy efficiency devices or charging stations, uh, but they don't necessarily benefit from that. And you have a user who would benefit from it, but it maybe isn't going to stay there very long, and so they, they don't have an incentive to go ahead and pay for the installation cost. So this is a big challenge that we're seeing in California. Um, we have a, a goal that the governor set for getting 1.5 million electric vehicles on the roads in California by 2025. And with the amount of uh, apartment dwellers that we have in California, we're going to need solutions um, to getting infrastructure into those into those buildings. And so Stacy has a, you know, interesting, compelling business model to help make that happen. Um, so one of our goals in trying to reach our carbon targets and, and uh, trying to reach our electric vehicle adoption targets is to help identify the barriers for innovative new business models that are coming along and then address those barriers. And so Stacy has been kind of at the forefront of pushing the interconnection issues that, that uh, these projects are going to face. So by working with him, we can see the issues that other folks are going to have down the road. And so we are trying to be actively involved 
so we can understand those challenges uh, and hopefully come up with solutions that make adoption for, for all the th elements that he's working on easier for everyone. All right. Heather? <clears throat> so the California ISO um, heard about this project and we're like, it's, it's too small. So we operate the grid um, for the majority of the state of California and um, also we provide an energy imbalance market um, in the West. And when he first came, we're like, well, I don't know. And he's like, no, let me help you understand the scale. So getting all of the resources aggregated, it becomes meaningful. And as Adam alluded to, distributed energy resources are coming onto the grid. There is so much distributed solar on the grid right now that's not visible to a system operator that with him coupling that with energy storage, it makes it more flexible. It makes it visible and flexible and controllable. Um, can you go to the duck curve, please? I want to make sure everybody understands what this is actually showing us. So the duck curve is a net load curve. So what it is, is as a system operator, you are balancing instantaneous demand with supply. So what we used to do, call this load following, is we used to actuate generators to follow that load curve. Now what you have is um, variable generation in the mix as well. So what we've done is we've taken the variable load and we've tracked out the variable supply. So the minus wind and minus solar, and what you get is that net load curve. So this is what the ISO has to follow and balance on a second to second basis. Now what you see here in the belly of the duck is you see the success of solar. It really shows the decreased need for additional generation in the middle of the day. And it's, it's a fantastic thing, but coming with that now, as we build more solar and we have more out there, we get into a situation where we have oversupply, we have over generation. And so what this project helps us to do is have storage on site with the solar so that you can manage any excess you have at the time with the energy storage. So what we're excited about here is we have distributed energy resources that are now visible to the market and they're controllable and dispatchable in the market and they provide needed services for um, smoothing out uh, the curve. It's clean. We're not actuating um, fossil fuel generators um, to help meet the state's uh, greenhouse gas goals. So we think it's important to um, match solar with storage now. Um, we're working on the market rules in order to incent that to make it you know, more meaningful so people will do that. Um, right now in California, we're working um, in collaboration with the Public Utilities Commission and the Energy Commission to develop an energy storage roadmap. And the goal of that is to facilitate advancing energy storage in the market. And after AB um, 2514 and the decision by the CPUC to mandate energy storage targets, we had over um, 38 projects in the queue totaling 2,200 megawatts of energy storage. And I'll tell you, most of that was coupled with solar. So I'm very encouraged that the industry is understanding this message of the need to be able to manage the duck in the future and to manage it cleanly. Right. Thanks. Um, can you hear me? We're good. So uh, I think when Stacy first approached me with this project, it was just Stacy and Frank, his partner. And uh, I remember our reaction was, that is so huge. I mean, that is, that is the vision of what storage can do. Um, it can capture multiple benefit streams, enable more solar, and bridge the gap between renewable energy and clean transportation. And the idea, and this was way before any legislation on storage. I mean, this was early. And um, you know, at that time, it was our hypothesis that you can be cost effective with storage. And the, the key to unlocking that cost effectiveness is capturing multiple value streams. And the closer you get to the customer and being in multifamily um, and some affordable housing units, I mean, you, you, you don't get any closer than that can capture the most value streams. It was also huge in that um, Stacy's concept represented innovation 
that uh, was completely new in our industry. I mean, the idea of bringing Netflix to EV charging, <laughs> you know, different business models, different user interfaces. Um, it, it was an example of um, bringing new applications and, and uh, how consumers can inter interface with their smartphones and their computer and the internet to get core services done to bring thousands and thousands of, empower thousands and thousands of end users into services that they previously didn't have any access to, and that's both solar and EV charging. And finally, um, we felt it was huge because um, by doing this, enabling affordable clean energy, EV charging, um, and supporting the grid, um, it was furthering the concept of an affordable grid for everybody. And, um, and generally, that's where we want to head, is leveraging distributed resources, clean distributed resources, to make the grid affordable and reliable for everyone. Great, so you know, different perspectives, uh, obviously, <clears throat> um, and given the unique nature uh, of this project, it was certainly not without some challenges and obstacles. And, and we're in implementation mode right now uh, in San Francisco. Um, but, you know, I, I think we've tried to think about some of the obstacles in a few, a few big buckets, you know, that the, we and, and the teams have had to work with Stacy to overcome. And Stacy's talked about um, the whole interconnection process and the costs associated with that and working with uh, the local utility, you know, to get the necessary approvals uh, to move forward. And I think a, a big piece that Stacy touched on that maybe will will kick off with is the policy and legislative angles around that and and that effort working with the different constituencies here um, to get the approvals get the policy in place to actually move forward with the project um, so maybe start with janice and come back down <laughs> sure um, well, uh, you know, since Stacy and Frank got started, there have been certainly a lot of great, great policy developments. And I'd like to say, you know, there was a pretty significant role that PowerTree played in helping to make some of those policy innovations a reality. I mean, in so many meetings, their concept was the poster child of what's possible and that this can happen, you know, within months. So, um, you know, I think it is a bit, it's, it's symbiotic and it goes back and forth. Um, and uh, so some of the big things that happened since the creation, we, we had our um, AB 2514, which was the first significant legislation that um, encouraged the PUC, required the PUC to open a proceeding to look at energy storage and the different roles it can play on the grid. Um, uh, also at the same time, we had, um, through our long-term procurement planning process, um, a requirement that uh, utilities purchase some energy storage, and that earmarked a, a focus that uh, Heather here is leading up and looking at a, a roadmap for energy storage. It spans multiple jurisdictions to uncover barriers. Um, we have, uh, over the last several years, reauthorized our favorite, um, and I think it's the solar communities, one of solar communities' favorite programs, which is the self-generation incentive program, which over the years was amended to also provide first-come, first-served commercialization incentives for stationary storage, and that has just been reauthorized legislatively a few months ago, putting another four hundred plus million dollars into that program. So I think all the, the groundwork is set. We've got some very interesting rules that the commission has put forth. Um, and uh, now I think we're really um, where the rubber hits the road and kind of educating the various stakeholders on how do you get these projects interconnected? What forms do you fill out? How do you process these applications and, and make it happen? So um, I don't want to talk too, I'll let you cover those. <laughs> But um, you know, certainly being first, and I think Stacy, your project's going to be the first out of the gate from a, aggregating a distributed project and providing services to Kaiso. So being first has its challenges. But yes, you know, indeed. thanks to you, it'll be a lot easier for the next one. <laughs> now all I got to do is figure out how to get a royalty out of that. <laughs> 
So from an ISO perspective, we um, manage the interconnection to the transmission system, so the, the high voltage uh, electric system. And obviously, this is interconnecting to the distribution system. What we needed to do is figure out how we get these distributed resources, these resources not directly interconnected to the transmission grid, to provide services to the wholesale market. So the wholesale uh, market is all about balancing supply and demand, as I said, in a reliable way, maintaining reserves. So. We didn't get too involved, um, other than feeling his pain in the <laughs> distribution interconnection process, because once he gets interconnected, then he can register in the ISO market. We have requirements for um, metering and telemetry, which Stacey just said, tell me what they are and I'm going to put them in. Um, but we do recognize as the ISO, we need to get better at what those requirements are for small distributed resources because they can be a significant part of the cost. The thing to think about um, in interconnection from a distributed energy resource is while Stacy is um, not selling his power to a utility through a PPA, many distributed resources are. And those utilities look for um, resources that can qualify for resource adequacy in California. So it's something that the, res the utilities must procure a certain amount of resource adequacy for system, local, and flexible. In order to qualify for resource adequacy, you have to come into an ISO process. You have to come into the ISO study process, and you get deliverability. So one of the things to keep in mind in this interconnection process when you're installing distributed resources, if you're going to engage in a PPA with a utility, they're going to want it to have resource adequacy, so you need to go through an ISO study process. Now, Stacy didn't have to do that in this case because he you know, has a different business model, but it's something I just want to make sure you are all aware of in that. Um, other things from a policy perspective, um, we are rolling out at the end of this year um, improvements to our interconnection um, guides. We have a new resource interconnection process. Uh, we try to make it easy for people to understand um, in terms of what happens when interconnecting to the ISO takes about two years. I know, I know. Um, it's because of the studies and the power flows and all the other resources competing for um, access to the transmission system. So we've tried to lay it out. If you're a distributed resource, it doesn't take two years because you just have to take however long it takes the distribution company. You come in to the ISO process after your approved interconnection there is, you go through the certification and um, you can participate in the ISO market. So I'll leave it at that from the policy and interconnection perspective. Uh, on the distribution interconnection side, um, you know, Stacy's project really revealed that we don't have a good solution for um, distributed resources on the customer side of the meter. Um, historically, when it came to interconnection, the utilities were interconnecting generators um, through interconnection agreements that were at the uh, at the transmission level, and they were interconnecting local load, household, commercial load, and they just did that through a standardized tariff. So you just had everything was pretty simple. Um, and then a few years ago, we had to start dealing with solar. So a lot of you are familiar with the, those issues. Um, and so we came up with Rule 21 that addressed those interconnection issues for when you have a distributed um, generation source and it's not controllable, how does it, how does it fit into the grid? So we, we solved a lot of those problems there. Um, but what Stacy's project is revealing is that when you have something more, more complicated, when you have um, storage, when you have controllable loads, when you have um, controllable storage, when you have solar, uh, it's much more complicated. And our, our, our solutions, uh, our current interconnection policies don't, um, don't provide a good solution for that yet. And so what's helpful when these projects come along is that staff at the commission can work with the utilities and the developers so we can understand exactly what those challenges are. Um, the utilities often approach, or are still in the mindset of there's generation here and there's load here. And they, they don't have easy rules to deal with that. And when they encounter those obstacles, a lot of times they say, okay, this doesn't qualify. Um, I can remember a, an example on another project um, that's also innovative in, in different ways um, that's dealing with interconnection issues where 
uh, the where they were looking at uh, managed charging, controlled charging, and discharging um, uh, vehicle batteries um, onto the onto the grid. And um, the utility came and said, "Well, this is this is a generator, and so we're going to need to um, treat you like a generator. And um, there's already too much generation, so we we're not sure there's room for additional generation at this particular location." And the developer said, "Well, I can control all my." My discharge and I'm really managing load here but from the utilities perspective it was a generator because it was interconnecting to the wholesale market and that's what a generator does and so this it, it, another example where the utility looked at this and said you're either load or you're a generator and so we need to develop those rules so that we can accommodate something like Stacy's project so Stacy maybe from your perspective from the entrepreneurial side we've talked about some policy, some interconnect. Are, are there? Do you have things to add on those topics or other sure. particular challenges from from your side that had to be dealt with? Am, absolutely. First, first, one short note. My hair is this length, but it used to be his length, and that's because I made a promise that to my team that I would not cut my hair until we had revenue operations going. So. <laughs> Commitment is the number one uh, in, in getting these things done. Um, the, uh, the other thing is uh, it really was critical um, to have a clear story to tell, to identify the different stakeholder benefits. You know, what, is, what does the tenant get? What does the building owner get? What does the PUC get? What does the ISO get? What does the grid get? What is the you know what does everyone get from the project? Because if you don't have everyone's interests aligned, and you don't understand what those interests are, then you're going to have conflicts that will derail you. I mean, there there were at least a hundred points over the over the last four years as we've been working on this that this could have gone completely off the rails. Now that's like every other week, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, by keeping focused on what those benefits were, being open and clear with the communication with each of the different parties involved, and doing it in a collaborative fashion as opposed to a headbutting fashion, uh, which you know, it's uh, it's easy to fall into the the idea of damn it that utility or that so and so is you know stopping me from doing this. I'm going to go you know raise a ruckus. No. Uh, it really was get in, get negotiate, understand the issue, find a different rule, and then bring it to the interested parties who can help you get that, get that there, and share what that those learnings are. That's been one of the real keys, I think, in in helping to make this this come forward because it is important. I mean, we can't do everything that we're laying out to do for every possible uh, unit of demand that there will be for this. So there's going to be a lot of other players who are going to come in and try to do similar things. You know, we happen to be early. Um, the other aspect is don't underestimate uh, how much custom software and custom development you actually have to do. It's not as simple as it may appear. Um, and you know, pay attention to that. Like some of the data curves uh, that we showed here, we started by doing data collection. We went to multi-unit uh, properties and we put data loggers on all sorts of different properties to understand the characteristics. We put data loggers on um, you know, different kinds of, of multi-tenant properties to understand their characteristics at one second intervals um, for more than a year before we started really being able to do the analysis. We went and we uh, wrote a, uh, a data spider and we started collecting and logging data from uh, 5,000 EV chargers around the country so that we could understand how EV chargers were actually used. I mean, so up front, we spent almost two years just collecting data and then building our design and focusing the business model around that data. Um, so those are you know, patience, persistence, and data. Uh, Jamie, can I add one? Please. So while we're on the policy topic, I think that the other key barrier, which frankly we're still wrestling with, and, and it's sort of a, a question mark at this point, is the role of the utility. And um, uh, some years ago, there was a decision that the commission made which said that uh, utilities in California 
um, cannot vertically integrate and own EV charging equipment, but it was a temporary decision that said, we will revisit that and see how it goes. And the rationale was to give third parties and developers like Stacy and others a chance to get going, innovate, um, and uh, there's a rulemaking now happening at the PUC, which is coming back and revisiting that policy question. But in the interim, um, one of the investor-owned utilities in California submitted an application to uh, vertically integrate and deploy EV rate-based uh, EV charging equipment in their service territory. And um, the, the outcome of that is still remains to be seen. We're working collaboratively. Um, but that the, you know, depending on which way that goes, I think it's significant because I think it would be really hard for um, companies like Stacy's to compete with a solution that is free to um, to uh, ratepayers. And uh, it's also significant the outcome of this because I think the rest of the state is looking at what what happens, and and, and actually um, the rest of the country and the world in, in, in some part. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's it's a big barrier. It's an umbrella barrier. But how do we um, work collaboratively with utilities because they maintain a special role in operating the distribution system, maintaining reliability, keeping it affordable, enabling access to everybody, um, yet at the same time preserve innovation and competition, and particularly in this space where the electric power system overlaps with electric vehicle charging and energy storage and that super complicated software and all these different applications, um, it is our opinion that this is an area that we do very strongly want to encourage innovation, encourage investment, because, I mean, I think Stacy's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, who knows what's going to get cooked up next. And if there's not an open competitive market, we may never see those applications. Yeah. Uh, could I build on that? Sure. Sure. So this is an issue that's um, that the commission is looking at right now. This issue of utility, the utility role in, in infrastructure, and I think that Stacy's project highlights a lot of the challenges with getting infrastructure into the toughest spots, which, from our perspective, are workplace locations and apartment buildings. Um, it's it's tempting to look at this as, a, as an electricity issue, getting electricity to the spot. But as you look at Stacy's project, you, you start to see that there's a lot of complexity about uh, you, when you have a charging station, you need the site to be happy. It needs to work for the site. And you also need a driver to be happy and, and have something that works for them. So a product that, that works for them and something that works for the site. So electricity is a component of that, but it's also about how do you um, how do you make your, your product available to a driver? Like what kind of subscriptions do you use or how do you bill them? Or um, you know, what is the, how do you bill for a particular charging event or do you not do that? So that's one issue and so they need to have a, a way to, something that works for the driver on that side. But then on the, the site side, um, one of the big challenges is parking and access to, to parking spots and who has control over that parking spot, who can determine when somebody parks there, what do you do when a car is full but it's still in the spot. Um, so a lot of the issues uh, get far beyond um, you know, just electricity load and bring it to uh, bring it to the car. And so I think that his project highlights that. And that's something that as we're evaluating the, this issue, we're, we're, we're thinking about. We want to look at it more broadly than just an electricity, uh, an electricity service or just building infrastructure. Great. So I'd, I'd like to leave a few minutes for questions uh, at the end, but the last question uh, that I have for the panel, um, given where we've come with Stacy and Powertree on this initial project, um, you know, where is this headed? You know, and it's I'm sure a question Stacy thinks about a lot. Um, you know, from Panasonic's perspective, we are long electric vehicles. Um, we have a well-publicized relationship with Tesla. We're one of the largest lithium-ion producers in the world. Uh, we'll be a part of the large facility that's going to be built not too far from here. Um, so we are very much involved on the product side. Um, I would love to see this model expand um, to other cities and municipalities within California, you know, other parts of the country, uh, to really expand the platform and the capability. So 
where where do we see the growth? What are the drivers, the inhibitors, um, and things that we'll need to collectively be focused on to really expand this? Uh, well, there's a couple. First, we have to get a lot of willing property owners. Um, and uh, just as in, uh, in solar, um, standardizing the offerings, making the, uh, the offering clear and economically compelling, and communicating that. The, the communicating is, uh, is really key. Um, the demand is definitely going to be there. I mean, the fact that the actual consumer demand is outpacing the regulatory requirement by three to one or more uh, says that there is a strong demand as the vehicles get better. They get longer range, they get higher power, they uh, are already rated as some of the best and safest vehicles out there. And the economics are incredibly compelling uh, for, uh, for the typical driver. So, you know, the next major steps here, I think the, the issues will continue to get worked through as the utilities learn. Um, but now it's about you know building out the the partnerships, uh, finding the property owners, finding you know the way in which these kinds of technologies can be coupled with the uh, experience and the customer base that existing solar installers uh, have developed over the years in their own business, and maybe shifting the mindset a little bit to not just selling a product, but providing the service. Mm -hmm. Uh, two things I guess I'd mention. One is we talked a lot about the uh, the interconnection process, and we need something that's standardized. It's uh, easy to understand. Um, the utilities don't have a lot of experience in this, and so one of the challenges that Stacy would run into is that he would deal with different parts of the utility who weren't always familiar with all the steps uh, in the process for a resource like his because it was so new and they hadn't encountered it. Uh, so some of this will go away over time, I think. But we also need to make adjustments to the process just to make it straightforward, more straightforward, easier to understand, and actually uh, moves along more quickly. So that's one issue. The other issue that we didn't talk about very much is the distribution costs, upgrade costs. Yeah. So when you it put new load at your facility or your home, the utility will come out and evaluate the distribution system. And if you need to make, uh, if they need to make an upgrade, they're going to bill you for that upgrade, or at least part of it. Um, so when we we first encounter, I first encountered this when we were dealing with uh, upgrades associated with electric vehicle charging stations in residential areas, and there was the potential that when you install the charging station, you could face a cost of like thirty thousand dollars from the utility. Um, there, there wasn't a way to know that in advance. Um, it depended on when you got your vehicle. If somebody got the, uh, a vehicle before you and got the last bit of capacity on that transformer, and then you came in. Um, you'd have to pay the thirty thousand dollars. Was the, the way the rules work? So he says, "Okay, what we're going to do for now, because we need to, we need to figure out a way to deal with this cost, um, is we're going to we're going to socialize that cost, and we're not going to put it on the individual user, um, and that will stay in effect uh, until mid twenty sixteen, while we continue to evaluate the cost. Um, so, Stacy's project also encounters uh, the distribution cost um, issue, and so a couple questions that come out of that is one, if, if you're if he's installing and a, a transformer that he's um, connecting to is already overloaded, what happens then? The utility is supposed to upgrade that. They're supposed to um, pay that cost. Um, they're not supposed to assess it on the, the that individual project because uh, it's already overloaded. So what do you do in a case like that? Um, like how do you deal with, um, with that particular upgrade? So that's one issue. And the other issue that I don't know if Stacy is exploring or not, but the potential, the way utility looks at an upgrade is they say, they, they add up all the load and assume that all the load is going to be on and then they say okay can the transformer handle that but now we have all more technology that enables us to vary loads um, and if we could get a signal from the transformer to say you know the load is high right now I need some things to to decrease to keep a, a below its its level um, you could avoid upgrades and so that's something that I, I hope we get more opportunities to explore and I think there's a big opportunity there to avoid distribution costs then good idea. So we see this going as increasing distributed energy resources, just getting more and more um, on the system to meet um, the greenhouse gas goals in, in California. Um, the leadership in California, the governor, is very, very motivated to um, reduce greenhouse gas. Um, climate change is central to the policies that are made. 
um, at the legislature, at the Air Resources Board. And we have to get serious about doing this reliably. I think we're going to get more and more solutions. We've got to get our policies right. We've got to change the rate structure so that when you look at the duck curve, that's the spring. There's a flock of ducks. There's a duck for every day, and it's different. When you look at the spring and the fall, you need to have that flexibility in the middle of the day to soak up that energy. It provides so much opportunity for additional uses. Um, hydrogen, if we go to hydrogen as part of our um, climate change uh, strategy, we're gonna have to do electrolysis. A lot of load on the system. We have a big drought in California. Uh, desalination is another huge use of electricity. So we got to get the policies right to incent the right behavior, you know, on the distribution system. You know, solar has got to start coming with the ability to control it. The smart inverter um, ruling that came out from the PUC is one step there. But we've got to get the the rate structure and all of that correct, so you're not just adding cost. So I see it going. I see it moving forward. Um, we need help to know what's possible technically. I think this project is showing us a lot of that and we just have to get the policies right in order to do this reliably. I'll be super brief because I know we're running out of time. Um, but I, I think that the key to unlocking um, rapid proliferation um, both in California and around the country is to um, create a new framework of collaboration with the local utility. And that touches both technical issues, how do you interconnect, educating the various departments, to uh, how do we collaborate and, and really attack that cost structure, reduce that interconnection cost, and go even faster. And once that collaboration is in place, our prediction is there will be opportunities to unlock even more sources of value. There is no reason that a project like Stacy's cannot be supplying flexible capacity. RA, other services to the local utility. And we have this other thing underway in California, um, another bill, AB 327, which is looking at the locational value of distributed resources. So it might be the case that certain geographies or zones or buildings um, deliver extraordinary um, large amounts of value to the distribution grid that should be compensated. So really, I think we're just at the beginning. Um, some people say MUDs are a failed market. I disagree. I think we're just getting started. Thank you. We have time probably for a couple of questions. I think there's a microphone somewhere uh, floating around. Anyone? Questions? There's one right here. The yellow shirt. Hi, my name is Gary Davidson. I've been worked in utilities for a lot of years, 35 years. I'm an engineering technologist. Uh, some of the questions that came up here, of course, to Stacy, great innovation, and Frank, for your founders of this. Um, what are we looking for payback? You know, as far as that revenue neutral point on a, on a system like this with capital, seed capital being so high. Uh, and two, from all your data logging and all your initial investigation, well, what are we looking at for how close are we to the model? Well, when you went to the all the players, how close were you with your model when you actually said, this is what you get? Good questions. Let me see how much time I got left to answer that. Um, I'll give you the very quick answer so we can get some additional questions. I'm happy to talk after afterwards as well. Um, in terms of uh, paybacks, um, we have multiple different components in place. So depending on um, you know the scale at which you want to look at it, and I'll, I'll like to look at it as the total project because that's what I what I worry about. Um, we're about a three and a half year payback, uh, with uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, and the reason for that uh, is to one is we have a certain amount of incentives coming in, uh, not ITC, but uh, really the self generation incentive program is the primary one that helps. Uh, cover that because there is no tax credit for storage except under a very narrow set of circumstances that our types of, of storage use don't wouldn't allow it to qualify for. Um, so you have to you have to keep that in mind. Um, and then in terms of the the modeling relative to the needs, 
Um, that modeling um, has turned out so far to be very good, but we use that modeling to design the size of the system, the products, um, to scale the electronics, to scale what we had to do, and so forth. And so there were there were many, many different vectors uh, that we had to consider, not just the energy utilization profiles. Probably time for one more quick one. Thanks. Uh, my name is James Lowen. I'm with the California Public Utilities Commission. Uh, Stacy, I was interested in your comment that 45% of the costs uh, were, were taken by interconnection. I, it's my understanding that PG&E is planning to introduce an online interconnection um, uh, procedure in the, uh, for small ones near near term and larger systems in the more distant, uh, or maybe even a year or so. Do you think that's going to have a, a benefit Official impact on this inter inter interconnection uh, costs? I'd love to see the details on that um, okay. because I definitely uh, there's a potential for that because the um, the amount of information gathering that you have to do uh, up front to properly size it and estimate it and get your costs right, um, most of that, uh, huge vital chunks of that you can't even get until you've actually submitted and paid the fees and, and are starting the study. And then it's only after that is done and you're committed because you're not going to spend that money until you've got a site agreement, until you've invested in it, you've paid your salespeople, you're paying your overheads and all the rest. So the more information that can be available up front, like you know, site loads, uh, the existing circuit capacities, the existing voltages that, that they think are there, like we found sites where the voltage was supposed to be one thing and it was really another, um, and people were running the wrong voltage equipment. Um, thing. So I think that could be extremely helpful, but if it's up front before you go through the study, because the, the developer can really assess many, many things very quickly and help to make it more efficient for everybody by having that kind of information up front. All right, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning. Please fill out an evaluation. They're probably in the back. Um, and please join me in thanking the panelists. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Thank you.